Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Hawk Blogger Mornings. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger, and it is the final Sunday before the NFL draft. So we've got something good in store for you today. We are going to have a, another edition of the Seahawks Draft Roundtable. We are swapping out C. Mike Spinmu, Griffin Sturgeon, and swapping in Jeff Simmons at Real Jeff Simmons in the middle of a busy family weekend, all sorts of stuff going on. He's making time for us. And we will also welcome in Rob Staten as soon as he's able to get on here. Jeff, how are you doing, man? Oh, man, I, I'm good. I, I get very uh, a little anxious at this time of year. It's like we've me and you've spent feels like months just studying these players and doing sim simulators and drafts and we're finally here and like these are the next four days i just like i'm so curious to see how this plays out at this point so <laughs> this time's hard for me like i'm feel like i've spent so much time like i'm ready to go and then so much just bullshit comes out this week and it just tries to like throw you and i get i get anxious like I, i'm ready for this thing to go yeah, it's definitely the time where everyone's kind of locking in their perspectives and some of them make sense. Some of them seem like they're way out of left field. And that's why we have this show to bring people back to reality. And I want to welcome to the show once again, Rob Staten, Seahawks draft blog. Rob, so good to have you. Thanks for taking time again on your weekend to, to talk Seahawks draft. How are you doing? very good thanks yeah i uh didn't know if i was going to make this because uh i only got in from work like half an hour ago and uh for the timings i thought oh it's fine i've got like an hour and a half's leeway to get back and the roads driving back from where i work were a nightmare so it's like mad rushing and uh, really pleased that i can get in in time to uh to talk some draft yeah well i think it's really important to recognize that you haven't taken down the pictures and in, in behind your wall as part of a new era of seahawks draft blog uh journalism um i know that's been a big story so uh by the way those are those are pretty sweet you got a witherspoon so you're you're pretty up to date on your your seahawks swag in your in your uh background there yeah can i give a plug for the uh for the the artist who made yeah this? please um tyler shaw is his name he is obviously a seahawks fan and uh he has just done a, a fantastic marshall on lynch uh, painting as well, which Cam, I believe Cam Chancellor has put up in his in the bar that they have. So um, he's incredibly talented. So we have that, and then uh, I have obviously the the classic Marshawn Lynch uh, groin grab uh, for the second uh, Beast Quake, and I have a Cam Chancellor uh, celebrating against the Panthers as well on the wall. That's fantastic. Well, you also I noticed really timed your exit out of Dubai well. Uh, it seemed <laughs> like hours later the place was underwater so uh glad you guys got back without having to deal with all that um all right so there's a bunch of things we could go through rob you know you teased that you had a question for us so i don't know if you want to start with it or you want to get to it a little bit later i, I saw that you had your latest mock draft up on the blog we can talk through that as well where do you want to start okay let me ask this question because i think it's quite interesting and I'd, I'd be interested to know what you guys think about it so let's imagine a scenario where John Schneider actually, he really likes Michael Penix Jr. He likes the arm. He thinks that that sort of X-factor ability with his downfield throwing is, is of interest to him. You know, this is a, a GM who in 2011 supposedly had Andy Dalton's name written on a card. So he has a varied interest in quarterbacks. Let's just imagine for a second that Schneider really likes Michael Penix. And Ryan Grubb saying, yep, do you know what? He is, he is perfect for us. I, I'd love to work with him again in the NFL. If they are both in that zone where they both really like Penix, how would you feel if the team gave, let's say, the Broncos a pick in 2025, let's say a second rounder in 2025, to move up to 12, to usurp the Raiders, to take Michael Penix, and then potentially 
if they were to make such a huge move like that, talk to the Raiders about a deal for Geno Smith um, down the line, whether that was after the draft or even during it. How would you feel about that kind of a scenario? Because I, I do wonder, I, I mean, who knows how the Seahawks feel about Michael Penix Jr. I still think he's a huge wild card in this draft purely because of Grubbs' um, role with Seattle and the arm and the talent. I just wonder, you know, it, it, if you like him and you are that close to getting him, why wouldn't you go and be bold and, and go and get him? So I wonder how you two would feel about such a move like that. Jeff, why don't you go first on that one? I would be stressed about the price. I hate it that they don't have a second round pick this year. However, I think the big thing with me and quarterbacks, I, I remember talking to you, Rob, about this last year. If you really like a quarterback and you deem him as the franchise guy, you can't just sit and wait for him. You have to go get him. It's way too important position. Frankly, I don't think the Seahawks really have the roster to make a move like that. But if they felt Penix was this good and they have the best intel on the guy, I would be I would be on board with it because, listen, there's so many issues with the roster. and But the big one is they don't have that quarterback of the future. I think it would be a probably a, a little it'd probably be a little dangerous for where they are as a team. And but if Huff and Grubb and they get they're signing off on this, like for me, it's just they're so captive what they can be right now. And if if Penix hits and becomes as good as I know Brian has alluded to, it changes the whole trajectory of the franchise. So I would be on board with it, but man, I would be nervous. That is a lot that basically puts John Schneider, I think, has a lot of time right now. I think he's got the ownership's ear. I think this is his show. I think that would really speed up the clock and that would change really dynamic of the franchise. So I'd be nervous, but I can swallow it because, again, that position really changes the ceiling of your franchise. Yeah, when I think about, I mean, I've definitely, Rob, you and I have talked about this. Jeff and I have talked about it. I certainly have made no secret of my opinion of Michael Penix and that I think he's got, he's got elite ceiling um, and I think a high floor as well. I look at the, all the criticism we've leveled at the feet of John Schneider for taking two quarterbacks in 14 years and only one of those before the sixth round. And then you look back and realize the Seahawks franchise hasn't taken a first round quarterback since Rick Meyer. And that's astounding. That is, I mean, for the Seahawks to have won a Super Bowl, made three Super Bowls, and have never used a first round pick on a quarterback to do it, other than if you consider the trade for Hasselback, right? I think that involved a first round pick, if I'm remembering right. It's, not the typical way. <laughs> that is not the typical way. So I I think that John Schneider, he's going to have to prove it to me, Rob. I think that he's a saber rattler. He likes to make noise about, yeah, I'm interested in Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, I'm interested in Josh Allen. Yeah, I'm interested in these guys. But when push comes to shove, he's not the guy making the moves to go get them. And we can say it's because of Pete Carroll. I think it's because of John Schneider. I think that he hasn't had the courage of his conviction to make a move for a quarterback like that. And I think he's very fortunate that Russell Wilson turned into what Russell Wilson turned into. I do think it was a good evaluation, but he waited till the third round. So if he thought he was going to be as good as he was, he wouldn't have waited to the third round to spend a pick on the guy. So I, and that's really, if we really are being honest, that's the only quarterback John Schneider has ever really plucked out of the draft, like out of obscurity. Geno Smith for me is not an example of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I'm glad that's worked out, but it's not the same. So I guess when I look at it, one, I personally would be excited because it would impl imply that they think they found somebody. It would be a fun, it would be a fun ride. Let's see. I think from a roster building perspective, I have some questions about it. Some of the th same things Jeff said. And on the Geno Smith other side, I think it's one of the oddest things in the NFL right now where I think his value is immeasurably higher to the Seahawks than it is to any other team. And I don't know that there's any other team that would make a move 
for Geno Smith anytime soon. So I guess that part of it for me seems the least likely, but I, I mean, if I'm giving you odds, I think there is less than a 20% chance for sure that I would think that they would make a move for Michael Penix. Um, it would be really interesting if he fell to 16 though, which 50, 50 chance maybe. Where are you, Rob? What do you think? Well, I think it'd be fascinating if they, and as Jeff said, if they really believe that Michael Penix Jr. is the guy, I think they have a duty to go and get him. And the Silks are unique, uniquely positioned because of Grub and have more information about him than anybody else. And because of all of that background information, if, if I was watching the draft and all of a sudden it flashed up that the Silks were, say, picking 12th or 11th or whatever, and they took Michael Penix Jr. I think that'd be really exciting because they would be they would be making a bold statement about that player. Uh, that this is the you know they've never really done this, have they? Traded up to that extent. So if they were going to go and do that for Michael Penix, I probably would find it exciting. And look, the highlights video for Michael Penix is one of the best highlights videos you will ever see. He his his collection of big time throws is fantastic. You know, there's there's very few quarterbacks who can live up to that. So I'm sure we'd all enjoy watching that throughout the summer. I agree. I think it's it's perhaps unlikely, but I just, I, I wrote about this the other day. I, I found it a little bit surprising that there's been a bit of talk about, well, could Penix end up in Seattle? But not much. And given that he's on the doorstep and he's he's Heisman runner-up and he got the Huskies to win in a game and winning the national championship and his, and his offensive coordinator is now in Seattle, you'd think there'd be a bit more talk about, one, should they take him at 16? Or two, if he isn't going to be there at 16, should they move up for him? And I can see in the comments a few people saying, ah, you know what, you're only talking about him because he went to Washington. It isn't that at all. Like We could all talk about the flaws within Michael Penix's game, and everybody's gone over that to death by this point. Everybody knows what his weaknesses were on tape. But I'll tell you now, there's, uh, there's only really two players that have, I've seen have a better arm than him. And one of them's Patrick Mahomes, and one of them's Josh Allen. And they're the two players that, Schneider claims to have really liked. So I do think the Seahawks, there's a good chance the Seahawks are going to draft a quarterback this year. It may not be Michael Penix. They might not trade up for Michael Penix, but I do think they're going to take one. And I do think John's now in a position where I think he is going to be determined to add players at that position as he begins the search for a, someone who can be the answer for you know more than a few years. I, I actually agree. I've been having the same feeling, and I want to get back to that. There's been a couple Super Chats I want to get out here. Uh, Garth Knight, who is one of our more, most prolific Super Chats on this show, says, uh, I could be watching the second part of Rebel Moon on Netflix, but I can't get enough of the Canadian, Brit, and a Yankee on a Hawk stream. So thank you for that, uh, Garth Knight. And also, Jonathan, uh, Super Chat says, Thoughts of wide receiver Deontes Walker out of UNC. Uh, Rob, you have any thoughts on Mr. Walker? And one of the worst senior bowls you will ever see. Uh, dropped virtually everything. Um, I just think he's he's somebody who flashes a little bit, and then you kind of get a little bit excited, and then he has a bad game, and you think, nah. Uh, there was the story with him; he was ineligible to play last season, and there was a big hoopla about that. And then he eventually became eligible to play. And people had a lot of sympathy for him because it, it was a ridiculous NCAA situation. But then as time has gone on, people have questioned, well, how did he get himself into this position with that? So I think he's somebody that he, the idea of Tez Walker is better than the reality of Tez Walker. And I think there's a whole bunch of receivers I'd rather have instead. Uh, one more here. Another from Garth Knight says, Brian is trying to call people out. I feel in doing so he's saying John is, or was the problem versus Pete. Yeah, I, I'm actually not trying to call anybody out. I think, I think that people have assigned blame as they will, or, or as they choose to along the way. I think that I have some insights into the way John thinks and in the dynamics and who he is as a person. And if John really wanted a quarterback, I don't think he would just be pushed over by Pete. I think 
he did if he had enough conviction to do that i think he would have made the the strong case to do it and he wouldn't have backed down if he was getting pushback but i wasn't in the room so i don't know and i i think that's just my assessment and even if john didn't want to make the the case at the top of the draft there's been a quarterback to draft every year in rounds four through seven to take a flyer on. We haven't even had a Josh Portis like player on the roster for 10 years. So I don't, I still think quarterback is a concerning position of evaluation for John Schneider. The fact that he was, I thought it was a joke when people said that drew lock was a required part of that deal for Russell Wilson. And that that was like ridiculous Every sign since then points to the fact that that is true. And John Schneider believes, and his personnel department believes or believed that Drew Locke was their next potential franchise quarterback and had something great in him. And he talked about him even this offseason like that. So that should be concerning. That should be concerning for anyone who's a Seahawks fan. It's the most important position. The moves that John Schneider has made so far is trading for Charlie Whitehurst signing Tavares Jackson, signing Matt Flynn, drafting Russell Wilson, and then like signing Gino as a backup, but like trading for Drew Locke. These are not like the moves of a guy that you should say, yeah, he is a quarterback whisperer. He's really knows that position. So I think there, we should be very skeptical until he proves otherwise. The same way we should be skeptical of this defense until it proves otherwise and so on. Go ahead, Jeff. And, I don't know if you guys heard the uh, John Schneider show last Thursday. And for the most part, I hope you didn't. It was pretty awful. But there was one thing that kind of caught my eye and kind of alarmed me. And I know we've been talking kind of a little bit about John's kind of taking control of this franchise. And Wyman and uh, Bob were asking about, like, how they're setting up this week. And, like, it was from Thursday on. And he said, like, they're setting up their board and they're going through the board one more time with the staff and then the next day the coaches come in and they compare uh, notes and they want to see if any the coaches views are different than the personnel's view. I found it really strange that they're not doing that together and the coaches are not really involved until the end. And basically they said, once the coaches go in with John and they kind of go through the board, then they're going to have a meeting. I think it was Monday or Tuesday to go over differences with all the Intel they have from this coaching staff. I found that a little alarming. Uh, maybe I'm overreading that, but like if I was Wyman and Bob, the first question I would have asked them all week really is like based on those early drafts where they had that intel from Pete and they had those performances, like how are you guys leveraging that intel? And the fact that they said the coaches aren't really coming in until like Monday to go through the final board and then they're doing another meeting on Tuesday. That made me a little nervous considering that intel that should be a huge competitive advantage for them. I don't know. Am I overreading that or is that like, and then John sends out the personnel guys to do the press conference. And I'm like, I don't know. Like they have this huge competitive advantage at their disposal with Harbaugh and Huff and Grubb. They know these college players probably better as well as the scouts do. Like they really should be leaning into that. I found that a little disconcerting. Can I give you two, two different reads of that? The most optimistic, the most pessimistic. And then Rob, I, I'd like to hear which one if, if you think is most, most accurate. <laughs> so let's start with the most cynical read. John Schneider, the first time he has ever had full control over the football organization. John Schneider, who has had to do some things that he thought maybe was crazy for years because Pete Carroll was the head of personnel and he just had to adhere to it. And... John Schneider had to put up with for years the implication that his great moves were somehow assigned to Pete Carroll and he didn't get full responsibility. So now he gets the choice to not only pick the coaching staff, but to pick all the personnel. And he feels like coaches potentially have gotten more credit over time historically than per the, the personnel department. So now he wants to put the player personnel people out front. The coaches don't go to the combine. The coaches don't do the press conferences. It's the personnel people uh, and that this all is part of maybe too much ego bleeding into it for John Schneider, as opposed to really coming together as a partnership with his new head coach that he's hired, Mike McDonald. There hasn't been a lot of evidence of partnership. And so the other things are like what Jeff said, 
uh, not taking advantage of coaches' insights. Pete Carroll, his first three years here, had a ton to offer in terms of personnel and insights because of all the USC people that they had. So that's the most cynical perspective, that they are letting ego get in the way of actually blending coaches and personnel and not taking full advantage of that. Most optimistic is the coaches are figuring out how they're going to make this team great. They have full confidence in the personnel department to pick the players to match what they need that there actually isn't that much of a difference between one scheme and another, and that they need to just pick great players and the coaches will coach them up. And this is actually a better division of labor than what they've had before, where there was too much uh, invasion of coaches into personnel moves, and now there's a more clean separation. Those are two possible interpretations. Rob, I'm curious if one or the other sounds more right to you or you have a third interpretation you want to offer well i think really we'd have to know how all of the other teams do things i think one of the things that i suppose that i'm a little bit envious of is i know full well with the charges for example what will happen with them is harbour will say i want him and they'll draft him and in seattle i think what you've got is because you've got a first time defensive head coach and you've got a first time offensive coordinator and a first-time defensive coordinator, I don't think any of those guys are going to stand up to John Schneider and go, no, I disagree with you, John. I don't want that player. I think what's probably going to end up happening is they're just going to lean into whatever John thinks. So, and then once the players come in, if then, there's, there's always, I'm always a little bit fearful of the GM has drafted this player. We actually don't think that much of him, but we're going to tow the party line because the, the boss wanted him. And then when they get them in, you're not that committed to sort of making it work because you always kind of think, eh, if it were me, we wouldn't have taken this guy. So I hope that it's it's greatly co collaborative. I never was a great fan of sort of Pete Carroll, uh, maybe sort of saying, that no, no, I want to go this way. And John's kind of suggested that they never really disagreed or Pete never pulled his weight. But one thing John would do is if he knew Pete didn't want to do something, he would just acknowledge that internally and then shape his opinions based on what he knew Pete would be more favorable towards. And I, and I find that sort of an awkward marriage. And I don't know where the Seahawks are with this. And I kind of almost hoped, what I kind of hope is that it would all mesh very well. And I'm sort of waiting to see what is, what's going to happen with this. I think it's going to be interesting. And uh, yeah, um, I really hope that Mike McDonald's not going to be a bit of a a fish out of water with this and um and john's just gonna do what he wants and it may not work and here's the other thing mike mcdonald's a defensive minor head coach and if john is going to be like quarterback heavy now build up the offense how you know by the way mike you're going to get a couple of free agent linebackers and a cheap safety and you're going to get this and now turn water into wine how is that going to work as well i'm fascinated by it i i think you could look at it positively or negatively but i just want to see what they do this week uh, and see how they build from that. Because I, I do genuinely think this could go either way for the Seahawks of this, this new era. Rob, let's talk about your new latest mock, which I think came out today. Is that right? Or was it yesterday? Uh, it was today. Yeah, yesterday. I thought it was just today. And you, uh, you had a couple interesting things happen. You had a lot of trades going on in the first round. Uh, Jeff and I also did some mock drafts. So it'd be interesting for us to talk about where we see things the same, where we see them differently. And ultimately you have the Seahawks with Byron Murphy available at 16, trading back with the Cowboys. And in a happy upset, in my opinion, uh, at 24, Graham Barton's still available and you have the Seahawks drafting Graham Barton. Personally would love that. And I think in the second round, with the second round pick that you have the Seahawks picking up from Dallas, you have them picking a quarterback. Talk mm. about that. So, yeah, with the, with the trade initially, I, I I think Jeff and I talked about this last week. I'm, I'm not that really in favor of trading down because if Graham Barton wasn't there, I don't know who else I would have paired with the Seahawks. And that feels quite risky. But I do think increasingly that look i read too much into these things guys i don't know if you're like me i read too much into these things i see the best sourced beat reporter in seattle suddenly randomly tweet an article about spencer rattler this week and i know it was an espn article so brady henderson is you know 
might just be supporting a colleague. But I just look at that and I think, has he heard something? You know, is is like Rattler on their radar or something like that? So I and then there was the there was Rick Spielman on a on the CBS podcast that he does with Ryan Wilson last week, and he did a three round mock draft. And he got to 81, and Rick Spielman had the Seahawks pick. And just completely out of the blue, and I'm going to throw a curveball here. I want to have them taking Michael Pratt. And it just made me think, do you know what? I just wonder if there's a word within the league, because Spielman will be talking to lots of different people. What are the Seahawks going to do? What, what do you see happening here? I just wonder if there's a feeling within the league that at some point the Seahawks are going to take a quarterback. So I went into this mock thinking, okay, I'm going to have them trade down. I'm going to have them trade down to acquire a pick to take a quarterback. And I think there's a chance it could be it could be Penix, it could be Rattler, it could be Pratt. I think they're sort of the three at the minute that I would uh, I would look at. Um, and then the other thing with the mock draft, the reason why I have Graham Bart available is because I think it's quite interesting because there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about the offensive players going very early. And I think we are going to see four quarterbacks, three receivers go in the top 10. Brock Bowers is going to go in the top 10. And then if there's two offensive tackles, that's your top 10. So all the defensive players get pushed down. And if the the Jared versus and the Leatu Latus and the Chop Robinsons and people like that end up in that 18 to 22 range, it might be quite hard as much as Pittsburgh needs, you know, or Miami might need a, an interior offensive lineman. They might go, yeah, but we didn't expect this guy to be here. This defender's a top 10 pick any other year. So they might go in a different direction and that could mean that someone like Barton is available for them. And, and the final thing I'd say about it is, I, you know, when John Schneider talks about like the, the offensive line, he kind of has like a wry smile. I always think like he's, he's well, well aware that everybody's saying, you've not addressed the offensive line. And I think in his mind, he's very much got a plan and uh, knows that he's going to execute that plan next week. And I, I suspect that Seattle's first pick, there's a, there's a pretty decent chance that that first pick will be an offensive lineman. Jeff, one of the things I found when I was running through my latest first round mock was I think that the edge rushers in this <clears throat> draft, in the first round especially, if I'm looking at a group that might get pushed down farther than what's been mocked that feels like the group i think there's there's medical questions on lot too we don't know how those have turned out for teams he's a specific type of edge rusher jared verse is a specific type of edge rush edge rusher uh dallas turner toolsy but one year production like i could see teams absolutely liking byron murphy more than or or one of these offensive linemen more than one of the edge rushers Chop Robinson's got all sorts of potential, but hasn't done it. You know, all these things. So I had initially, I was having like no edge rusher go until the teens. Like I had Dallas Turner not even going. I ended up switching that around. But that feels like a pretty big part of it. And if I remember looking at your mock draft, you had the Seahawks trading as well. You had them trading with the Eagles to pick up one of their second round picks. And you had the Seahawks picking Jared Verse at 22. Talk about that. I think John is going to want to trade down. I, I think it's his, in his nature. Uh, so in my mock draft, I agree with you, Brian. I think that's the position that could fall. And Barton is the guy I actually think might leap some of those guys. Uh, Pittsburgh's been linked to him. I've heard people say he's going to be in the top 20. And he might be the guy that the Seahawks don't even look at. And we're left wondering in two years, like, well, why didn't we look at this guy? We loved him. So I do kind of think the edge rush is the group that could go. And there's been talk of Atlanta moving down. And if they move out of eight, which I think I did have in my mock draft, I think someone moved up in mine for a Dunze. Then it might really push the, the edge rushers down because really that in every mock draft, they're taking Dallas Turner, uh, some people have Jared Verse there, but if they move out of eight, which I think I had, it has a domino effect that really, really, because they start that whole thing. And then the second one, Seattle's usually the first spot we look at them. And so if Seattle isn't at 16 and Atlanta doesn't take one at eight or moves out, it's hard to pin that next team. And that might not be told the Rams at 19. And if you look at all these teams, 14, like the Saints probably need an edge rusher, but their need a tackle is so big and it's just a sweet spot for the end of that run. I think they're going to end up taking a tackle. And then 
the Raiders don't need an edge rusher. The Colts could use one, but they have huge needs elsewhere. The Jaguars don't. The Bengals don't. So that's where that slide happens, and Pittsburgh doesn't. Pittsburgh's really comfortable at edge rusher, and that's where you could see that slide. So if Atlanta doesn't take one or is the only one to take one and Seattle moves out, and if they're on Chubb Robinson, they had him in for a visit, they have him graded similar, that might be the more likely pick for Seattle, and that could be a move down. But you're also at the danger of them going bang, bang, bang at the end of the 20s and the early if you look at the needs, there's just not a lot of teams that need an edge rusher. And that's where if Seattle moves at 16 and doesn't take one, it's hard to pin that next team. So I, I'm totally with you, Brian. There's another team here that feels like a real wild card in this. And that's the bears. And it's not the bears at number one. It's the bears at number nine. And there was a story that came out today. I believe rumors starting to swirl that the bears want to make do they, the new thing is to do the Texans. Like, don't just take one good pick. Take two of the top five picks. And the rumor is that they're going to move up and take Arizona's pick and come out of this draft with Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr., the top two talents in the whole draft. One, what are your thoughts? What's the likelihood that you see something like that happening? And two, like, where do you think in general, where do you think the Bears end up going, Rob? I think in your mock... You had the Bears sticking and picking Troy Fautanu, which is like, you know, makes sense. There's a you get some offensive line to help protect their new quarterback. So so how how are you thinking that's gonna play out? Yeah, I think uh, the Bears could do a lot of different things. The, the, the reason I went with Fautanu is they were they were quite critical of the left tackle at the end of last season. And um I kind of thought, well, look, I really liked Darnell Wright a year ago. I thought he was a top ten pick for a long time. And and then they took him in the top 10. And I think a lot of people saw that as a surprise when they took him. And I kind of thought, maybe Ryan Poles just, he'll do it again. Like my favorite tackle is Fatanu. So maybe he'll just do it again. So I kind of put that there. But you could easily see them uh, taking Bowers. You could easily see them taking Odunze or whoever the, the receivers that last that long. You could see them taking Joe Alt if he was there. You know, there's, it feels like everything's on the table for them. I mean, I, I have to say, I don't really know. Like sometimes, I kind of wonder what what's what is the Arizona Cardinals' plan? Like eventually, you have to actually add some talent. Like trading out all the time. Like so, they traded away from um, the defensive rookie of the year last year, and then traded back up to get Paris Johnson Jr., who most people saw as like a mid to late first round pick. If you if you don't want Marvin Harrison Jr. because you want I don't know the Bears first round of next year. Well, what are you like? Listen, I'm grateful if the Cardinals don't want to add really good players, but you know, eventually it's no good. You're no good having picks. Picks aren't going to win you a game. Like, if you've got a chance to draft Marvin Harrison Jr., or if you prefer Malik Neighbors, fine. Like, I would fear playing Marvin Harrison Jr. twice a year. We've finally got rid of Aaron Donald. I don't want someone like Marvin Harrison Jr. entering the NFC West or Malik Neighbors. Like, but by all means, trade out. Go and get somebody else like Paris Johnson Jr. at number nine if you want. Like, go for it, Cardinals. Like, I think that'd be a stupid move from their point of view. Um, and from the Bears' point of view, if they want to go and do that, that's fine. They don't have many picks this year, though. So they'd be having to trade into next year, you know, and giving up a haul to do that. And maybe a desperate uh, head coach and a slightly pressurized GM would do such a thing. Uh, I suspect they'd be better off just sticking and, and seeing who's left of the Bowers receivers O-line group and, and just taking your favorite player on your board. Yeah, I, there's a few things that that seem like critical linchpin moments in this draft, decisions that people are going to make. And it starts with the Patriots, I think. I, I, I'm not convinced that they're going to stick and pick. I'm not convinced of that. There's been some rumors that the Giants are a team that's looking to move up uh, and, and draft a quarterback. That would be, I mean, most people don't have the Giants taking a quarterback um, right now, it seems like an obvious thing for them to potentially do, but they don't have, I mean, they don't have the environment for a quarterback to thrive. They do not have a good offensive line. They do not have good skill players. So like questionable, but I guess my point is the Patriots feel like a really key moment in what happens in this draft. And then the assumption has been that the Cardinals would trade out. I, I think that would be weird. Uh, and the reason being, if I'm a team that wants to trade up, Arizona is not going to draft a quarterback. 
So why am I paying premium, another pick premium to go trade Arizona unless some other team has already gotten the Chargers pick at five? But the only reason you would get the Chargers pick at five is if the Cardinals pick has already been made and you know your quarterback. You're not going to make the trade preemptively and let someone else jump you. So I, I like unless someone wants to be the most sure. I think I think the Chargers is a more likely pick to be moved. Do you got do you agree with that, Jeff? I do. There's one wild card and the card, um, the Broncos are the wild card in that scenario because the Chargers might not want to give them their franchise quarterback. And it's an end of the division trade. And a lot of teams don't like trading in the division in general, but to give them their franchise quarterback. And if that guy hits, that's a decision. So someone like Denver might need to jump the chargers to beat out of Minnesota. And we know the kind of ego Sean Payton has and ego drives a lot of these decisions and a lot of these mistakes. And we've seen a lot of the mistakes from Denver over the years. So I think that's the one wild card to your scenario. Cause mostly you're absolutely right. If you're Minnesota, Trading to five would be a much better scenario. Lowers the price. The probably isn't going to have. But if you're Denver and you're worried about getting like blocked by the Chargers and you really want that fourth quarterback, and then you're, I think you're right, Brian. When you're talking about, I think if New England had a different owner, I think they'd be almost a certainty to trade down. Um, their team is not close to ready to be bringing a quarterback they have the marking of a team that's going to ruin a quarterback rather than save it but robert Kraft, i think is in his 80s um that team is just like grew like it's grim right now their roster's bad and so if robert Kraft's like we need to sell tickets we need to like re-energize this franchise they probably need to trade down and get a left tackle and a receiver like that's probably a better thing for them but I wonder how much the, it's a it's a coach that doesn't have a lot of like power in the building. He was kind of given the job, and then the Giants. If you think about the Giants, the name they give their tie to right now is Drake May. And if you remember, Brian Dable and Joe Shane came from Buffalo, where they developed Josh Allen, who similar kind of prospect, obviously very different kind of players. But they might be thinking we got to get a guy like this in the building. I think Daniel Jones is guaranteed money runs out after this season. So it's a really easy transition. So I think everything you said is spot on. And that's why this draft is so interesting because we don't know who's going to go to yet. And then the domino effects from three, four, five are huge. Yeah. I mean, I was interested, Rob, you had Tennessee trading out with Minnesota. That's, that's not been something I've seen other people um, predict. So that was interesting. Atlanta, you had Atlanta trading out with Jacksonville, um, which was a, a bold move. Uh, not not many teams move up for receivers, but you had that happening. It's happened with Julio Jones, so who knows? And and getting the Jacksonville move up for Roma Dunze. But Atlanta, to me, is one of the biggest wild cards here in terms of what position they go to. Everyone's gone Dallas Turner. I initially had Dallas Turner. Then I was like, Brian, Byron Murphy. Like, I think that would still make sense. Uh, they don't have great. Uh, I think they have David on and, and Grady Jarrett or something like that. They don't have a, a terrific interior. You can go all sorts of directions with Atlanta. It, it, what, what do you think Atlanta ends up doing? Um, well, I think the I thought Dallas Turner's tape was really underwhelming. Like the guy is obviously very athletic and has that the, the prototypical length, size, athleticism that you look for. Uh, but I just didn't like the tape. And I think with Atlanta, they they may well sort of say, well, look, if some, I, I do think the Jaguars have to do something. I think they need they are a franchise that is on the is seriously risking ruining all of the hope that Trevor Lawrence provided that franchise when they took him first overall. And having lost Calvin Ridley to the Titans, a division rival, I think they will feel some pressure to make a, a splash, which is why I've got them going up and getting Roma Dunze, who I think would be a perfect uh, target you know, for, for Trevor Lawrence and just a perfect A-star character human being for the Jaguars. Um, but then with the Falcons, it's if they're sort of looking to move down so that someone like Jacksonville can move up, I don't think that if they say, well, we could get Latu at 17 or or Verse, you know, why is the difference between Turner and Verse really that? I don't think it's different at all. I've got Verse, you know, rated a tier higher. So I I don't I, I don't know why they wouldn't seriously consider that, especially if they get a bit more stock. I also think 
Do you know what? I think there's just a lot of assumptions. And I think this is important to say when we were like four days out. A quick reminder, like, can nobody, there wasn't even a, a hint that Baker Mayfield was going to be the first overall pick in 2018. That news came out the day of the draft. And I'm just saying, Drake May, I, I don't know if you've seen Jeff Legwald's rankings in the last 24 hours. He's 23rd on his list. I've, I've seen every game that Drake May's played. Take my board for whatever you want to take it for, but he's in round two because there's, there's there is some physical talent. He's not super high ceiling like some have suggested, but there's so many flaws there. I think he's a round two talent that you could probably justify taking in the Jordan Love range if you were that kind of team. I think he's a Jordan Love level player uh, in terms of draft stock. But everyone thinks he's going to go top three. Well, what if he falls a little bit? Like Josh Allen was supposed to be a top three pick and he went number seven and the Bills traded up to get him. So what if what if May lasts a little bit longer? You know, JJ McCarthy is a second or third round talent. Now I get the intangibles, and teams and owners will convince themselves of him as a person, but the tape does not say you must spend two or three first round picks to acquire this player. And what happens if on draft day, this is why I have him lasting to to seven, and then the Vikings moving up. The, the teams might just go, well, we don't want to spend three first-round picks to go and get J.J. McCarthy. And then the Cardinals go, well, we'll, we'll have to take Marvin Harrison because we're on the clock. And then the Chargers might find, well, okay, we're not going to get three first-rounders either. How much are you willing to lower the price? And if they're not, they might go, well, we just want our favourite offensive lineman or Malik Neighbours because they need a receiver as well. And then all of a sudden you're getting down the line and it, he still he lasts a little bit longer than people think. I don't think it's automatic that May and McCarthy go as high as people think. I'm almost certain that New England, as Jeff said, will take one because the owner... I mean, they've not even made Elliot Wolf the GM, have they? They've basically made Elliot Wolf the... Well, you do all the scouting and then I'll, I'll make the decision on what we do in number three. That's Robert Kraft. So, so they're going to take a quarterback. But then the other one, you just wonder, you know, where are they going to go? And I think this might be a bit more unpredictable than... Um, than people think. I think the only guarantee is that the top three receivers will go in the top 10 and that Brock Bowers will join them. I think people, I know there's been a lot of talk about the value of the position, but there's just there's so much buzz at the moment that he is going to go very high, like top eight, nine, he is going to go in that range. It's funny. That's, that's one of the guys that I do have slipping down still. And we'll find out. I, I can totally see Je you, Jeff and I talked about this before, before the season even ended, Brock Bowers is one of the clearest blue chips in this draft. Like, I, I still believe that to be true. I also, from a draft strategy perspective, I can see where teams would be like, these tackles are going to go. There's not tackles in the second round if I need one. The wide receivers, there's this tier. Like, just some of the same stuff. And so right now, I have Brock Bowers going at 18 to the Bengals. I haven't, oh, I haven't okay. lasting that long. We'll see. But he, won't, he, he won't, he won't, he won't last that long. But let me tell you just a quick point on Atlanta that we were talking about. Atlanta's GM, Terry Fontenot, is a big best player available. He took B. John Robinson as early as he did because B. John Robinson was top of his board. He took Drake London because he was top of his board and he took Kyle Pitts because he was top of his board. Even though they drafted Kyle Pitts, if Brock Bowers is there at eight, it would not surprise me if Atlanta Falcons say he is top of our board and take him. Seriously, they don't care about positional value. They just take who's ever top of their board. And if he's top of the board, they'll probably take him. That would, Atlanta fans would lose their minds. I mean, if they had Kyle Pitts and then they go to Brock Bowers, I would love it <laughs> personally, but I don't know if Atlanta fans would. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's been a number of stories kind of coming out this week. Uh, Jeff, anything that's caught your attention as far as, you know, rumors, changes, things going on uh, in general across the league? Um, there's a lot of buzz about Byron Murphy. Um, he is the guy that I would love to see get to 16, but uh, there was a story this week that he could go in the top 10. Uh, I think Atlanta was mentioned as one of the teams that could look at him. Chicago is one. We talked about the bears earlier. Um, their coach is a defensive minded head coach that was with the Colts when they trade for DeForest Buckner. They're not very good in, in the interior of their line. They trade for sweat last year. And then if the Raiders don't take a quarterback, that could be the guy it's getting harder for me to see Murphy get to 16, which is obviously disappointing. He was the guy I see, but his buzz has definitely caught my eye. Um, the other one is it seems like Jackson powers Johnson 
is now trending to be a second rounder. That was a guy that, like, when the combines, the senior bowl happened, like, a lot of people were putting him at 16 to Seattle. Yeah. Or I know Rob was like, I rewatched his grade. He looks like a second round pick to me. And a lot of buzz is now that I think his over under, like, went on the draft sites was 31 and a half. So they've clearly caught on to that. He was a guy, again, looked at 16, 20 in one of these early mocks. I don't, I think if they trade down, Seattle ends up trading down he might be an option for the Seahawks. But the one thing I, we talked about before is it's like, and it's the thing I can't stop thinking about is that we look at the, the mock that Rob did. And if Graham Barton is gone in that mock, they're in no man's land. And that's the scenario. And that's the thing that's really caught my, Brian, we did those shows last week where we did all those trade down mocks with Derek. And if you end up in like the mid twenties, although the sweet spot of the draft you're essentially drafting players that should be taken in the 40s. And yep. so that's my big takeaway. If the Seahawks are going to move down, I think with that Washington trade, the 36 and 40 is a far better move than getting down to the 20s to get an end of second rounder. I don't think you end up in a great scenario on either round there. So I think you either stick and pick at 16 or maybe a trade out of the first round entirely. Yeah, I... <laughs> Uh, there's a couple stories I want to get to, but just responding to what you were saying there. When I went through yesterday, I ended up having the Raiders jump up to 11 to snipe Michael Penix from. I, I think I think Michael Penix is in play for the Broncos too. Everyone has Bo Nix as the as the guy that's going there. They've met with Michael Penix. I think Sean Payton knows what he sees there, and I wouldn't be surprised. So I have, if that happens, then I have the Broncos working with the commanders to move out of that spot. The commanders come up and get the second best tackle to protect their quarterback that they drafted at number two. And, and so I don't even know. We'll see. We'll see if like the, if the commanders deals on the board, I think that's a, a certainly one that is a one, a scenario for me right now. Um, I agree with you on that, Jeff, but the names I was going to bring up and I wanted your thoughts on these, Rob, uh, Jeff too, if, if you have any, some guys that I've heard moving around boards. So all of a sudden, I mean, li terrible linebacker class, terrible linebacker class, no first round grades. All of a sudden, Edrin Cooper creeping up into a lot of late first round mocks. Daniel Jeremiah talking, Junior Colson might sneak into the first round. I'm like, I love Junior Colson. I see that guy as a third round player. If he's a first round pick, something's crazy to me. But okay, that might be something happening. Um, Mike Sainer still. Um, I think he's creeping up boards. He's just at the edge of the first round. In my mock, I gave him to San Francisco, which pained me because I'm like, God, he would be really good. Um, so those are a few of the guys that I think I've, I've seen. Oh, Marshawn Neeland has steadily started. Like most, it's like early second, but he's also a guy that is starting to show up as potential late first round. Any of those guys you have thoughts on about whether it's it's real? that those guys are moving into the late first round or whether you just think it's, it's just talk. Uh, with Neilan, I think it's, it is real because if you look at the vast majority of top pass rushers in the NFL, there is a correlation between great agility testing and uh, they, well, they all have great short shuttles, essentially like everybody, like the Bosa's uh, Max Crosby, you know, all, all of them, you could pick what, you know, the, what, TJ Watt, you know, his brother, they all were fantastic short shuttles, great agility testing. And Neeland ran a, a ridiculous 417 at his size. Now, there is some refinement that is required within his technique. He is more or less a, just a, a, a crazy ball at the minute, running into blockers, but he is so powerful that he's very effective with that. And if you can tap in, you can show him a bit more pass rushing technique, get him to use his hands a bit more to disengage. The burst and agility is there. For him to be a real threat so i do think there are teams and he he really feels like the kind of player that the ravens for example would take so in that sort of 30 range you could well imagine him going there i do think there's a chance edrian cooper could go in the late first that has been talked about for a, a, quite some time I, I was hearing that about six weeks ago that there's a chance that cooper could go in the late first he tested well at the combine there was a report of the when he turned up at the shrine bowl and then didn't do anything and was uh, reportedly asked why he basically just told everybody, well, watch the tape. 
and that kind of soured people a little bit. But I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he's probably just badly advised that week and probably just shouldn't have bothered going to the Shrine Bowl if he wasn't going to do anything. But there's definitely some talent there, some physicality. He is a, you know, I like a linebacker who is going to put his head down and fly to the ball carrier and smash them in the face. That's what I want to see from my linebackers. That's what Edring, Edring Cooper does. I, I'm with you, Brian. I think Junior Colson is a very solid player, a jack of all trades and master of none. He's got no testing numbers because he's not done any workouts pre-draft. It's, it's really difficult to imagine him going into the first round. Can I throw a name your way as well? Because this is someone we have talked about, but I want to read you this quote. I don't know if you've seen, seen this. Uh, you, know, you can take this with a pinch of salt sometimes, but this is from Bob McGinn's uh, article today on uh, our good friend Darius Robinson. And I just found it such an interesting quote that I wanted to read this to you. Uh, it said, uh, he's determined to be great. That This is from a scout. That's what I love about him, and it's all real. Um, and then another one says, this sucker might have the highest ceiling in the whole draft. The build, the talent, you watch him in the SEC, they line him up over tight ends, blah, 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 blah. Um, he hits so hard, you think, holy smokes, they might throw him in prison for that. He is physical and violent. He is violent. He plays his arse off. He's going to be really productive. He can win out outside with a 4 9 7 40 because he can kick your ass. He's got enough get off. He'll win because he's got 34 inch arms and big hands. He's as good a grab and jerk pass rusher as there is in the draft. Um, but it's all complimentary. And there have been a few people who've said he could go in the top 20. And if we're thinking about an upset, you know, somebody who could go a bit earlier and therefore somebody else goes a bit later. And if Seahawks are trading down, like, because we can sit, you know, we, we had the chat, Jeff. It's very hard to find players in the 20s that you like. But if someone like Darius Robinson ends up going 18th or something, whatever, 19th, whatever it is, somebody else is going to last because of that. So is he somebody who could go a bit earlier? If Graham Barton's going to go earlier too, there's two players that were not anticipating being available in the 20s who might be available in the 20s. So I think that's uh, it, it's sort of, if you are not inclined to want the Seahawks to draft Dar Darius Robinson, then I think sort of having scouts talk that way is quite encouraging. You're saying it's encouraging because you think someone else, some other team might grab him? I think if you are, it's encouraging if you do not want the Seahawks to draft him and the, and and the hoping that somebody else will. <laughs> I have the opposite opinion. I got yeah. nervous hearing that. Yeah. But, but that's it, because th there is there is the other side of it, which is that when I was reading that, I can just imagine that all of those, he plays his arse off in John's voice. <laughs> well, so here's here's something we need to all just acknowledge. We don't know yet what defense Mike McDonald's going to play. The assumption has been, look at what the Ravens have done. Look at what Michigan has done. He's going to reuse most of that. And I think that's a pretty solid assumption. But he has said multiple times, and he seems to be a pretty like straightforward guy. He's not like, I don't think he is a duplicitous, trying to bait a hook kind of guy. He's like, I build my defense around who we have on the team. I'm going to see what we've got. And then there was a quote that came out in the, personnel press conference when the four personnel guys were out there and they were talking about their free agent additions. And he said, like they were asked, what's one of the things you really, you know, that is different with this coaching staff. And he said, well, one thing with Mike McDonald's, they really want versatility. And he, the first thing they said, they talked about Leonard Williams. He was a priority because he can play all over the line. The next player they mentioned Draymond Jones, Draymond Jones. He can play all, you know, inside. He can play all the way out to nine tech and, and that's a guy that for me, if you look at my, Mike McDonald's defenses in Baltimore and in Michigan, there isn't a 280 pound dude. Like there's not an outside linebacker that weighs that. They're all 270 and under, 265 and under, or they're 300 and over. And so if they're thinking about Draymond Jones and, and maybe there's something there, then Darius Robinson, the guy that I have pretty much eliminated from my board because one, I'm not as excited about him as other people. And two, He's a 280 pound dude that can kind of like, I don't see exactly where he fits, but I have to admit, I don't know what they're running yet. So that's what was going through my head as you brought that up. Um, but look, he, he, the problem is, is that like Devin Witherspoon didn't do any, any testing. And the feeling was that Devin Witherspoon wasn't going to be a great tester, you know, cause he was very slight. He was expected to maybe run in the four, four fives. 
part of me wonders whether he didn't run because he knew he wasn't going to run a great time and the Seahawks took him because he was a he was an absolute physical pain in the arse to play against who hammered people. And that's exactly what I've just read about Darius Robinson, who is also incredibly versatile, who can play across the line. So it is a... It is a look, I, I wouldn't be down in the dumps if they draft Darius Robinson, but I, I just don't think it'd be very exciting. I feel like they'd be drafting him because they want somebody to be a leader and not necessarily someone who's going to going to be a fantastic player. And there's that sort of... I, I, I do think he is a Ravens... Steelers type, but I also wonder whether he could be a Clayland Ferrell type who ended up going in the top five to the Raiders. In part, you know, Mike Mayock pretty much said it because he's a world class leader and he was considered to be Clemson's top man on defense. And you think, well, I really hope they're not going to go down that road just because he's he's a great <laughs> character guy and he's a. Yeah. He, he look, I mean, look, the bloke looks like he could could wrestle in the WWE. He's got a fantastic yeah. physique. But that's not necessarily going to mean he's going to be a fantastic player. And he doesn't have the great short shuttle. You know, he might look like J.J. Watt, but he hasn't, he's not got the athleticism. That's what to turned me Watt. off watching him at the combine. He just doesn't look like a sudden guy. He's just, like he's certainly powerful. Jeff, sorry, you, I cut you off. What were you going to say? No, I was really impressed that Rob pulled out the name I was about to mention. Uh, Cleland Farrell, like everything he was described, and Mayox admitted he made a mistake there in a lot of other podcasts, but the way he was described, I just picture that almost being a Schneider radio interview. Like those quotes, they sounded like the John Schneider and the Clee Farrell was so similar where he's made an NFL career. Like he was on the Niners this year. He was a rotation player, but I think it's a, just, it's such a projection. I, I think the Seahawks are in a spot where they don't need to make a projection like that. I think there are just some like ready-made players ready for them. And you look at their roster, uh, it's a big leap to, put a guy like that as your first round pick where you're just really lacking those blue chip talents and you're just making a, such a project. And Farrell had all the immeasurables. He had all the character. He had like hardworking guy. He just didn't have, he wasn't it. It wasn't him. Like the kids say, but that's what strikes me of this guy. I see him as like a second round pick being elevated based on character and measurables. And you look back and you're like, we just drafted like a guy should have won in the fifties. You guys are are giving me agita here. It, 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 like talking about Darius Robinson is like putting a pit in my in my stomach. I, I I'm calling this officially. I'm naming it the white elephant scenario, where the Seahawks think they're trading around the board and that they're going to end up with the great gift, but at the end of it, someone snags the one that they want and they end up holding like a pencil sharpener it, at twenty six. And that's Darius Robinson to me. That is like the dullest, least motivating, least franchise changing move. They when they could have stuck and picked at 16 and likely gotten someone who could be a franchise changing player. The white elephant scenario is my worst nightmare in this draft. And the, it basically picks 22 through 32, I feel like are a trap. They are yeah. an absolute trap. No fly zone, stay out of them, either stick and pick at 16 or trade out of the first round altogether and get a haul from like the commanders. That's where I'm pretty like focused. Unless, unless like Rob's scenario happens, like if they get lucky and they agree to pick him, I'd be thrilled to have Graham Barton. Like my personal number one scenario would be trade back, get Graham Barton, and then draft Michael Hall Jr. or someone else in the second round, something like that. I just think that is a massive risk right now. So that's where I am. Rob, you do have them trading out. What is your, like, is your scenario one trading up for Mike? Like it personally as like a fan, what you'd want, like, is it trading up for Michael Penix? Is it sticking and picking one of these guys trading? Back? Like, where are you on your scenario rankings? So my scenario one will be uh, Troy Fatanu or Talies Fuaga as a stick and pick. I just think... <laughs> I, I, I don't think either player coming in would transform the Seahawks into a contender or anything. But I, what I do think is you, you would get one of the best defensive linemen in the NFL within two years. And when's the last time the Seahawks been able to say that? You know, it's, well, 2000 and mid-2000s. When since they've had somebody who's legitimately one of the best offensive linemen in the league. And, you know, if that's if they did that and and then sort of just had that kind of a draft where you've stuck at 16 and you're not picking against later one, 
okay, you know, let's just have a bit of perspective on where they are. You know, year one of a coaching staff, let's be realistic about what they can do this year. And you just get some good players and you and you you, you have another off-season next year to build this thing up even further. Uh, so that would be my scenario number one. I think for scenario number two, I'm, I'm very content. There's like a cluster of players that I'd be very comfortable taking. You know, the edge rushers, uh, Verse, Robinson, you know, Byron Murphy would be intriguing. Penix would be very intriguing. Um, I'd, I'd be happy with any of those. Like, I, I think really the Penix one for me would be probably the most, wow, you know, kind of move just because I do think if we're, if we're going to see the Seahawks back competing at the very top end, they're going to have to have an exceptional... I, th I just think they're going to have to have an exceptional quarterback. And even as good as Mike McDonald's defense was at Baltimore, they did, they did have an exceptional quarterback. They had the MVP in the NFL last year in Baltimore. And um, I do think that McDonald's defense has really benefited. They were barely trailing at any point in the season, Baltimore. They were like, they were scoreboard pressure. So much scoreboard pressure. And I'd like to think that part of the reason I think they... I hope they brought Ryan Grubb in is because they think this is a guy who puts points on the board. Mm -hmm. Like the, I, I've interviewed a couple of Huskies in the last week and they both called Grubb a, a mad scientist, like that he will cook things up. You know, Fatani was telling me that they basically had one run scheme one year and then they completely threw it out because they wanted to catch teams off guard for the next. And I just mm -hmm. love stuff like that. And if they can, if they brought Penix in and they were going, right, we are going to outscore the league. And then Mike McDonald's defense is going to tee off. That'd be so such an exciting brand of football. And I think that's just what you want from your NFL team. You want to be excited. It, it would it would be exciting. But it's not the Penix or nothing for me. Like, you know, the idea of having the best defensive tackle, best young defensive tackle in the NFC West after all those years of Aaron Donald would be uh, enticing. I love the idea of Leonard Williams and Byron Murphy together and doubling up there and that being a strength. Um, I, th I think with the edge rushes, the only kind of pause I have is that as much as I think Verse and Robinson and 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 probably the other two that people are talking about in round one are probably better than Boya Maffei and, Dar and Derek Hall, who showed nothing as a rookie, John still, he drafted them. Like he thought they were, he thought Derek Hall was a first round talent, according to John he Boyle. Did. So, you know, if you're going to say, oh, we're going to take another one now, it's like, well, well, why did you draft Derek Hall? Like you, you, you've given up on him? Like it's, it's not a good use of resources. So, I'd almost rather like John still be have the conviction in Derek Hall to say, "Oh no, it's okay. Mike McDonald will sort him out. That Der Mike McDonald's going to get him going next year. So we're going to go and draft Byron Murphy or, or an offensive lineman." Uh, the other, you know, there was one other player I wanted to ask you about. Actually, there's two players I wanted to ask you guys about. Have you seen much of a Marius Mims? And how do you balance out the risk factor of the fact he's? I mean, I, I, I some people don't think he's a risk factor. Like some people think he's legit, like so talented, and he, just, he was just unlucky not to play as many games. But that you know that does. I think it's hard. If I was a GM, I'd struggle to take him just because he's played so little. But the talent is obviously there. And then with Latu, the because we talked about Latu a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? And I I'm, I don't know. I've kind of I've I've challenged myself on Latu a little bit because TJ Watt lasted to pick thirty. And people compare him to what, and he isn't what, because what had an incredible short shuttle and Latu didn't. Latu's short shuttle is the same as Brennan Jackson's. But if Latu lasts into the sort of the 20s, let's say, which some people think he might because of the injuries, if he is as good as some people think and he ends up being TJ Watt-esque and the technique does match more and that my fear that he'll just get hit in the face in week one and that he might not be quite as good, I mean, it'd be an absolute sickness having because they could have had TJ Watt and didn't. Yes, if they, they if, if Latu ends up being Watt or Watt esque, if Seattle picks someone like let's say Darius Robinson instead, and he ends up being Cleveland Ferrell, that is going to be yet another one where we talk about that quite often. I would suggest. Jeff, you want, what are your thoughts on Latu? I don't like. I, I came in. I see what people like. I see his te like his technical skills, his pass rushing skills are really good. I still just I come back to something I've said on other shows. When I watch this team and when I think about Mike McDonald and what they did well, the thing that always struck me and the thing that I've hated about the Seahawks build the last few years is they just are not building physical teams. And I want teams that play more physical. 
I we've talked about like this draft really lines up with trench players. Like that's the strength of this draft. You watch the Pittsburgh game last year. You watch other games. The Seahawks kind of get pushed around, and they had this picks last year, like four top forty picks. They take a receiver, a corner, and they barely touch the line of scrimmage other than Derek Hall, and they take a running back. And the thing I looked at, like Michigan, and like Jim Harbaugh drives me crazy for a lot of reasons, but the thing I admire about him is he built a team. Like I loved watching that Michigan team because how physical they were. You watch those teams play. They just beat you up, and they're bigger, and they're stronger than you. That's the thing, and that's the weird part about it's the biggest mystery of the Seahawks. If they came in wanting to be that Steelers-Ravers in their early drafts, they had – they inherited Brandon Meebane and Red Bryant and they drafted Cam Chancellor and those physical players just really created the identity of the Seahawks. We talk about the Legion of Boom, but they had, and even Max Unger, like he was physical, he was strong. The Seahawks got away from that and their best players became skill position players. And it was Russell Wilson. And I'm not saying Latu's like soft or anything like that. He's not. But what I want with this first pick and I want the Seahawks under Mike McDonald to become is a team that's built like those Michigan teams and like the Baltimore of the past and what the Baltimore's currently doing. They're bigger and they're stronger and they're Latu is just lacking in that area. It's to me, it's more of the same Latu screams of someone that Pete Carroll would have loved to draft. And that's not a knock. That's not a knock. Latu is a very good prospect. I see what Mina Kimes and Danny Kelly, why they're so high on him. He is a uniquely good pass rusher, but I just can't get that physical part out of me. And maybe I'm missing something. Maybe he is physical. I don't want to make it seem like I'm calling him soft or something. But that's why I like the Byron Murphy, the Fuanga, the Fautanu just strikes me. as like he can be like Tristan Wirfs. He was yeah. drafted in the same range. Wirfs is now like a top three offensive lineman. It's just an animal. And that's what I personally want. And that's what I think is going to help this team get out of this mediocrity circle they've become in. And Latu to me is more of the same. He's not Daryl Taylor, obviously. Daryl Taylor is probably more like a Chopper Robinson kind of prospect. If he's maxed out, that's probably more of a Chopper Robinson. But I worry about a – that's why Verse has struck me. If you watch Verse play, he is a physical like specimen. Like He bullies guys. I know he's a little older and he came from junior college – or not junior college, from Albany. He had to transfer. But him, Byron Murphy, like all the guys that me and Brian have really fallen in love with, they're those big physical guys. And Fua- that's why I'm with Rob Fuaga and Fautanu is my number one scenario. Byron yeah. Murphy would be my number one defensive player. And while I like, I wouldn't be devastated if they took Latu, but I would fear more of the same. If yeah. that makes sense. Those are all tier one guys for me too. And, and I, I just want to put a, a point of emphasis on what you were saying. I, I call it like the bagel approach to roster building, which is just, the middle is there's nothing there and that's like the offensive line for the seahawks the defensive interior like the middle the, the off ball linebacker like it's just there's nothing there it's empty versus like an arch where the keystone is placed right in the middle and all the weight is bearing down there i trust that that is what endures as much as i love a good bagel like give me an arch that last centuries built off of something that has been built from the middle out and has the weight bared in the middle of the team. And Schneider just hasn't, he has actively not done that throughout his tenure. And some of that might have been Pete Carroll influenced. Don't know. And so Latu for me, I won't, I won't belabor the whole thing, but I will just say he played better against the run his senior year. So he's not a liability against the run the way I think Dallas Turner is pretty close right now in some ways to a liability. Chop Robinson is definitely a liability against the run. Chop Robinson, I can see like gaining some weight maybe. But anyway, point being, Jared Verse is the one edge in this class of the high-end edges that I see as being both. He is just a bully. And that's why Marshawn Nealand is interesting to me. If like the worst case scenario happens and they are stuck in the 20s, I'm a little bit more interested in Marshawn Nealon's fit than I am even in Chop Robinson. And I realize that's blasphemy for a lot of people, but I have some concerns about Chop Robinson, all the projection going on there. Marshawn Nealon is, is an NFL athlete right now from a physicality standpoint. And so I'm a little bit, I'm more interested in the upside there, um, at least for the Seahawks. That is blasphemy, by the way. I know. I realize. I, I fully realize. 
Should we do, do we want to do, oh, well, let me do this. We have a couple super chats we should get to. Um, Hawks fan Matt Man asks, any thoughts on the unorthodox 30 visit that Washington held where they had 20 something players at once? <laughs> Gloria said a source told him that Jaden Daniels wasn't happy. For what it's worth, that might be why they did it is like, if you can't handle sharing the shine with other guys, then like they're testing to see who's the alpha for sure. Um, Rob, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, my thought on it was it sounds great until the player that you wanted to draft ends up being the one who complains about the whole process. Because then you, what do you do? Because if Jaden Daniels is the one of the group who is, is pissed and moaned about this and his agent was, was complaining about it or subtweeting a little bit about it, you think, well, if you wanted to draft Jaden Daniels, and the report, one of the reports was is that all of the other quarterbacks had to get an uber to the facility but the the commanders went and picked Jaden daniels up from the airport so that would suggest that well they're giving daniels a bit of specialist treatment here but then they bring him in and he's the one complaining about what happened so if they want Jaden daniels what has this actually gained like I, I i think the commanders it's it's frankly ridiculous that a week before the draft they're having this kind of like uh if, you know, if you don't mind me saying, a bit of a dick measuring contest. Uh, I think they had them playing golf or something, or top golf or something. But, you know, a, a week before the draft, the commanders should have known two months ago who they were going to take with the second overall pick. So all of this, we're going to have these guys in, we're going to do all this. What a waste of time! They should know now, and they probably do, but they've got them in anyway. What has any of this achieved? I think the commanders, you know, they might have new ownership. They still seem like a bit of a shambles to me. And uh, the Godspeed to them and uh, good luck to them as well, because you can have Jaden Daniels, but he, who is he throwing to? Who's protecting him at left tackle? I know they've got those two picks in, in round two. Well, they're going to have to move up. They have to. They have to find a way to get back into round one and get a left tackle, because right now, uh, Jaden Daniels is going to get killed uh, playing behind that offensive line, especially when he hasn't got easy outlets. He's got scary Terry, and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, we have a question from you from Brian Bowlby, a new YouTube member. Thank you for joining, Brian. He says, Jeff, if we drop back and get a second rounder, who is your favorite pick? In the second round or with the, at the end of the 20s? Drop back and get a second round. I think he's talking about a second round pick. Well, the name I liked, I would, if you asked me this like a month ago, it would have been Trevondre Sweat, but he's not going to, he's, he's going to be there later. Um, that would have been my pick before probably the DUI, which probably would be a pretty big reach at the end of the second round. I still really like Junior Colson. I, I think he is a really good sweet spot for that range. Um, I, there's a lot of there's a couple offensive linemen I like, but Junior Colson to me is that sweet spot. I think he gives them the middle linebacker. I think he is the kind of player you want to take in the second round. I agree with both of you that him going at like the end of the first round is a stretch, but end of the second round, like to get a, like a three down linebacker, you know, could play and could be a good leader and give you stability of that position. I would be really, and I, we've done so many mocks and I've always wanted to take junior Colson in that range. So that probably gave it away. Uh, again, Tavondre sweat is the guy like it just intrigues me. I know Brian, you, you have the same view as me, but now based on talking to people and based on people think he might be a day three pick. So taking him at the end mm -hmm. of the second round would be a poor use of resources for a guy who doesn't really play on third down. Um, if you're asking about the first round, I, I don't have a great answer. The biggest thing I've learned about this draft is I don't really like any player in that range. I'm a big stick. Co Cooper DeGene? No. <laughs> no. Do you not hear what I said about physical? <laughs> I think if, if you were a different a roster. The guy. Joking, he's, joking. Not, he's not a physical position. If, if you had a different roster and a different situation and you were in a different division, like if you're the Colts, like Cooper or the Packers, like Cooper DeGene, you can totally justify. If you're the Seahawks who are getting pushed around by this nine win Steeler team and you draft a yeah. safety, who's not even a safety yet. He's a projection at safety. Yeah. After getting rid of all the money at safety, I'm going to lose my shit. Same. I appreciate, I appreciate the uh, ribbing Rob. That that's, that's helpful. We need to give Jeff as much crap as possible. He's too happy as a Canadian. We need to bring it back down to earth. Garth Knight with a super chat for you, Rob says, do you believe like Brian that John Schneider is more at draft mistakes than Pete, who was terminated? 
I do want to clarify. If you've listened to my shows, I'm not saying that John Schneider is more at fault. I think there are certain positions. Like, I think the reason that the Seahawks have drafted running back as early as they have is Pete Carroll. I don't th- like you look back at John Schneider's lineage. There's no evidence that he's ever been taught anywhere to value running backs at a second round pick back to back years ever. Um, so I think there's some, I think wide receiver, which is his number one position he's ever drafted 17 of them, I think is very much a John Schneider tendency. So I think there's things that are John's and things that are Pete's, but go ahead and answer, uh, Garth's question here, Rob, as, as you see it. Well, I, you know, I, I, when we're talking about, we you know Pete was terminated and, and that does sound a little bit, uh, morbid. Like he, you know, he, he, <laughs> he, he, he you know, he has lost his job, but, um, I think with Pete. Uh, it, it's such a separate thing. Like, I, you know, I don't think Pete was to, you know, Pete didn't lose his job because of the draft. Pete lost his job because the defense stank for for years and because the, he kept talking about an identity and they never built the thing. So in terms of how who's to blame more for the draft, I actually, look, the Seahawks have made some really bad decisions in the draft. They've made some good decisions in the draft. I think that's mainly part of the course. Like the team, the best team in terms of team building over the last few years is, I think it's probably fair to say it's unquestionably been, unless you want to, you know, say the Chiefs, uh, it's it's been the Niners. And they have made some inspired trades, some inspired draft decisions. They've also made some shocking draft decisions. The all-time worst possible draft decision. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not even being hyperbolic here. I think the worst thing I've ever heard from an NFL leader is that we did not scout Patrick Mahomes because we fully intended to to sign Kirk Cousins as a free agent in the future. If the if the Niners had scouted Patrick Mahomes and had actually seen what Andy Reid and the Chiefs had seen in him, and not taken Solomon Thomas uh, third overall and had taken Patrick Mahomes, the 49ers would have been unbeatable. We might have been looking genuinely at a team that could have gone undefeated in the season they have been built that well so even the best make bad decisions um i just think this is a big sort of i'm, I'm going to call it like a three-year period now where the seahawks need to within three years if john john schneider's got to build a team that can contend he's got to find a quarterback in that three years he's got to build a team that contend i like you two i want to see the seahawks built inside and, and sort of hammer teams, even if it's just for the fact that I enjoy nothing. The reason I like football is because I want to see big physical blokes hammering each other. I And I want to see the Seahawks beat teams up again. I want to see teams come to Seattle and then lose their next game because they just got beat up when they played the Seahawks. I don't want to see the Steelers coming in, led by Mason Rudolph, and, and push them around. For <laughs> That's embarrassing with all the terrible towels going. Like that can't happen anymore. So, um, yeah, um, I, I guess I've not really answered the question, but um, I, I guess I'm not really that apportioning blame on, you know, to Pete. Yeah. Did Pete take D. Eskridge? Did John take D. Eskridge? I mean, we'll we'll probably never know. But I sus- But the one thing I did hear, you know, I read it somewhere the last few days was that I think it was one of the scouts who said it uh, that John essentially controlled the drafts. That's what one of the scouts said at the press conference in it that John essentially was the big decision maker throughout on the drafts anyway. So I suspect most of the draft decisions were down to John Schneider. I think that's right. Um, And John said that most of the time he and Pete were aligned. So there wasn't a lot of things to debate. Um, But we'll find out. We will find out because that's one of the things we're going to start to learn is there will be no doubt who is making the draft picks starting this Thursday. Um, You guys interested you want to do a mock draft you want to talk a little bit more i see a nod rob immediately is like let's do it i i can always do a mock draft now, the problem is though is when you know you have like a void in your life after thursday because you spend so much time on these mock draft simulators don't you like there's even a new espn have got one now and, it, and you can basically make any trade you want and it's it's actually quite quite good and um it's just another mock draft simulator to go through and you spend all I spend a lot of time on these things, and uh, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself after uh, after this week. Yeah, I find like next Sunday, like a week today, is one of the more bleaker days in like the football calendar. You know, there's like a ton of content. It's like 
you built up so much and then it's like it's over like what do i do now all right with that in mind let's go ahead and do the espn mock draft simulator we will uh follow that prompt from our guest rob staten and Let's see what comes of this roll of the dice for the Seahawks. We are going to start this draft and we're going to have it run through until 16. Now it has four quarterbacks going first, then Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison drops, Joe Alt, Dallas Turner, JC Latham. That is early. Brock Bowers versus gone, Arnold. But there's a name here that is just crazy for it to be available. Um, you see, the, the ESPN one, I, the reason I've liked this is because it doesn't tend to do this nonsense where Roma Dunde <laughs> lasts to 16. And then the first time we have a go on it, he's there. I mean, like, if you know, as, as much as we've all talked about building the trenches, you'd almost, I mean, you'd get a trade, a great trade off, I imagine. Uh, if he was, if he was still there, but, Jeff, um, what do you say we do this with Rob? Let's have, let's walk him through the commander scenario and see yeah, how sure. Rob feels. you good with that, Rob. Yeah. We're going to trade 16. We're going to trade back with the commanders and we are going to take picks 36 and 40. This is roughly an equivalent trade. They get, we get about a 10 point bonus. So we're moving completely out of the first round. And oh my god! Oh, oh my come god. on! I'm just been saying how good this stimulator, this yeah. Let's let's how good the stimulator this is, and Roma Dunze lasts to come on. 36. That's just too stupid. All right, let's do this one more time. Should we just go to our normal simulator? We might. We might. Let's just let's just see how this plays out. Yeah. No, he went. This is more real. Okay, this is better. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna make our trade still. We're gonna oh, trade I... back with the commanders, Ugh. and we're gonna take 36 and 40. Okay. So we always have to do this to ourselves. We have to actually see the pain of who we could have had. Um, Byron Murphy was there. Amims is a guy that Rob's talked about. Johnny Newton, gone. Michael Penix goes at 23. Graham, Graham Barton, Barton, gone. Troy Fautano lasts all the way till 26. He's gone. Jeff's favorite player, Cooper DeGene, is gone. Darius Robinson, first rounder to Baltimore. Darius Robinson, yeah, that's that's not crazy. So here's the thing, Rob. We don't have to do this because it gets a little bit more complicated. But one of the things I like about this scenario is if you get 36 and 40, you could very easily trade 36 and split that into like get into the 50s, get mm -hmm. another possibly third round pick. And now you've got five top 100 picks potentially versus two. Yeah. Um, in this case, let's actually stick and pick. I, I don't know if we've even done a stick and pick with 36 and 40 with Jeff and I. So at this point, well, we here's know. some of the names available. I know Chop Robinson jumps out to you. Um, any of these other guys, Marshawn Nealand is a name we've talked. Jackson Powers Johnson is still there. We talk about Junior Colson. You're going to have another pick in four spots. So you can get two of these guys, most likely. I mean, there's a real chance, isn't there, to get a couple of quite talented players there. You know, a two for one. None of none of the players, except, you know, I'd argue Chop Robinson, none of the players are, are, are as good as the ones you would have got at 16. But you still get two pretty good players here uh, at, at, at interesting positions. Right, right. So where would you where would you go first? If this is where you were, these are the names available. I mean, I would go Chuck Robinson just because uh, I think he's a. I, I just think he's got enough traits that are, are like Parsons that I would I would want to bring him in. So and at thirty, we're going to pick the value. We're going to pick crazy. Chop, Jeff. Who would you pick in this situation? I would probably take Chop at this spot and at thirty six to bet on that first step. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think you would have to roll the dice at this point. I. I think just sticking with my own, I would probably go Neeland over him, but I understand and I'm not going to argue. So let's go to 40. So now you've got these guys available. Who went in between? Um, sorry. Uh, Patrick Paul, Braylon Trice. That's super early for Trice and wow. Braden Fisk. Well, there's a big reach on Patrick Paul there. 
Wow. Yeah. So now is a chance where you could say you could get a Jordan Morgan who can play inside. Potentially you've got a few of the line, all the linebackers available because you don't pick again until 81. You got Bo Nix sitting there. If you're a Nix guy, you've got uh Tavondre sweat feels early for him. Any of these guys, Jackson Powers Johnson's another name. This is a reasonable place to be spending a pick on him. Where would you? Oh, Michael Hall. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I think this is where he's going to end up going. I don't believe he's going to last to the end of the second round. The, the two players that I would seriously consider here are uh, Ed, Edgerin Cooper and uh, TJ Tampa. Okay. All right, we're gonna let this is gonna be your draft, Rob. We're gonna have you make the picks, Jeff. Though I'm curious, where would you go? I would be looking at Michael Hall, Chris Jenkins, Powers Johnson, sleeper pick Ricky Pearsall. Mm, I, I, I'm. A it would not player. be a sensible pick. I think yeah. he might be the best of these guys. I'd probably end up taking Powers Johnson in the end. Yep. I just think the value is good. But man, Ricky Pierce would be tempting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Rob, you said Edger and Cooper or TJ Tampa. Yeah, Final I, answer. Uh, Cooper, just because he is the kind of physical uh, player. But I, I don't think they'll take. I, I, yeah. I mean, take, we're taking him, but um, I, I'm not sure I'd want to come out with a linebacker and pass rusher from these first two picks and then wait till 81. Yeah, that's the that's the challenge. Well, there's Cedric Ray. Well, you Michael just took Hall. a you just took a linebacker. Um, Michael Hall's still sitting there. I, so I it's Neilan, so it's Dorless, but yeah. Um, Jonah Ellis is a guy a lot of people have been mocking the Seahawks. I'm not as big on him, but Cooper I understand. Austin Booker, really interesting dude. Although we took Chop Robinson. Not sure where you are in Jalen McMillan. There's Spencer Rattler sitting there. No, there you go. Is that who you want? That's what I want. Done. Okay. J uh, Jeff, who would you pick in this scenario? Oh, Christian Haynes is there, though. Yeah, Christian Haynes or Michael Hall for me. I mean, uh, take Christian Haynes because there's, there's a huge black hole at guard in there. So Okay. All right. We are going with Christian Haynes. I don't think Haynes will be there that late. No. I don't know. He's he's pretty clearly just a guard, and those guys tend to to push down the board, but we'll see. Um, all right, so now we're here at the first pick of the fourth round. This is a great pick to have. Um, who have we picked so far? Does it give us? Yeah, you can't. Oh, no, you can. Yeah, so Chop. That's a pretty nice trap. Chop, Edrin, yeah. Christian Haynes. I mean, it is probably the best player available mantra. It's, There's yeah. got you this three. I mean, Austin Booker to me jumps out, but you've already taken an edge. I don't think you can make that. Well, now call. you can take Rattler. Yeah, I'd, I'd be taking Rattler here. I mean, I don't think he's going to last around four, but I would take him here. Okay. Done. We will take Spencer Rattler. We have another pick again, round four coming. Yep, coming up at 118, right? So a lot of the same names. So would you start being interested in potentially going doubling up on linebacker or do you start to potentially get interested in safety you've got you know cam kitchens where's mustafa um, on here i'd be looking at safety and tight end here yeah uh they do know oh, yeah so here are the safeties available so they have mustafa yeah right that's yeah that's a, uh, that's a real uh, sweet uh, spot and then I'd you say tight end and here are the tight ends that are currently available. Yeah, I would take Malik Mustafa or uh, Dominique Hampton. Which would you go with? Uh, well, Mustafa's higher on my board, so I would take him. All right. So Malik Mustafa just certainly fits the tough, even though he is kind of a safety, uh, although some project him as more of a hybrid linebacker kind of player. Um, definitely a physical guy. This part of the draft is going to hurt. <laughs> I have a feeling John's going to end up with a fifth round pick one way or another. So now we're here in first of two six round picks. Uh, where do you go here? 
Um, What's your take on Jalex Hunt? There's a lot of folks that have been mocking him to the Seahawks lately. Yeah, I, I I wasn't as crazy about him. Yeah. Where's your mic? Is I've got him in the sort of in the fourth round, and I have one, two, three, four players in round four ahead of him. Where are you on Jaheim Bell? Uh, I think he's he's fine. You know, he's very fast. I think he is the kind of I think he is the kind of tight end that they want. You know, somebody who is going to be a pass catcher who can they can move around and become a bit of a mismatch weapon. You know, not somebody who's an all-rounder, probably somebody who's just more of a bigger target who can be an X-factor on those critical third downs. So I think he could fit that role. I think there's probably two or three tight ends who could fit that role. Um, this, for some reason, does not... In, this this uh, simulator does not have Jack Westover in it, which is... Uh, mm frustrating because i do think he would be a, an obvious option as well i think Jay, he would you know i have bell just looking at where my i have him in round four so if you could get him in round six that would be a pretty good value yeah it's interesting the tight ends of like this in this particular sim or this run of the sim the tight ends have gone even like aj barner barner's gone um in this so do you want to look at any other positions you want to just see all or do you want to draft your best tight end here? Uh, keep going down. <laughs> Look where Leonard Taylor's got. Yeah, I think I'd probably take Bell here just because the values, it, it's a position you're going to have to address at some point. I think they are going to need a Michael Barrett, somebody that I think I can imagine them taking in this mm -hmm. kind of range. And I had him in the mm -hmm. mod draft yesterday just because, you know, if nothing else, he could be a good special teamer. Uh, yep. But I, I think Bell is, uh, yeah, you know, is somebody who could potentially be a contributing six round pick. So uh, you, how often can you say that? Done. Yeah. Six round has not been the Seahawks' best round for sure. Better in seventh round than they are in the sixth round, to be honest. Yeah, they have any six rounders? I don't know, man. It's it's pretty thin. I think, I think Byron Maxwell was a six rounder. Um, yeah, maybe. I think Anthony McCoy might have been. A, I think maybe he was a fifth rounder. I can't remember. But yeah, they've had. It's been pretty barren. All right, here we are. Our last pick of the sixth round. Then we got one in the seventh. Um, any of these names jumping out to you? I know Nathaniel Watson. We've talked I do, about. I, I like Watson, but we've we've already taken somebody who kind of does what like, he does. So I would go with Barrett instead because he would. I I think he's gonna. I think this is kind of the range that Barrett will go in. And I, and I think Barrett could be one of those. There are several players like this that are not great athletic testers, but generally just do what you need them to do at linebacker. And I've always kind of felt that if, if you have a player who can do that, then that's perfectly acceptable at that position. Do you I mean, have any question about James Williams versus Michael Barrett here? I'm just curious. I mean, I like, James, I like James Williams and have, I think I have Williams in round four. Uh, so if you wanted to take James Williams, the value would be far better. Oh, there's probably some other players who I've got in the round four range. Uh, yeah, I just I think uh -huh. they're it, it, to me. This is an interesting one in that Williams played safety, but he in some ways profiles a little bit as a as like a nickel backer. Uh, Michael Barrett is lighter from a linebacker perspective, maybe not a, a three down guy, but very good. And so I just have this question going to this draft, whether the Seahawks are going to like the safeties better than the linebackers. And while we have a gap, are they going to go, are they going to come out with safeties where we think they might go linebackers? I'm just like early on, it could be Javon Bullard, Cole Bishop, that whole crew later on. I wonder if these kinds of decisions will be made. So well, well Williams is a whole round higher on my board than Barrett is. So uh, that would be better value. Is that where you would pick? Uh, I, I, I'd take him because obviously we're going to have to go around the whole list here and we're, you know, digging yeah, yeah. through the value. So that's just all right, it. done. James Williams, not a guy we picked as often. So a little bit of variation. Then we got our last pick in the seventh round. He's very different to Mustafa as well. So that's a good thing. Yes. And then you could still take Watson or Barrett in the seventh round. No, oh, there you go. So Barrett go. Bear went. Yeah, he went. Okay, I've, I know who I want to take. Ryan Watts. Oh. Oh, yeah. Talk to us about Ryan Watts. Uh, just a player that stood out 
every time I watched him play. And he's he's like six foot four, has got 35, I think he's got 34 and a half inch arms, 35 inch arms at cornerback. Just long. I mean, he's probably more of a Pete Carroll corner than necessarily a Mike McDonald one, but he, he's versatile. He can play safety. He can play corner. Um, I just thought he was a. I enjoyed watching him play throughout the season at Texas, and I had him on the board. I, I actually didn't know whether he'd declared for the draft because no one was talking about him. And then he, he, it was he, then he was appearing on all the lists and everything. So it was like, okay, he's in the in the draft. But I think he's just somebody who in in, seven, in the seventh round has got a real chance to... But look, there's so many good players here, like Trevor Keegan still here. Yeah. Frank Gore Jr. I have to ask you, Rob, because I heard this on the Move the Sticks podcast with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks, and I still am not sure if I was being pranked or not. <laughs> but they were talking about, do you think... Who do you think is going to be a better pro, Spencer Rattler or Devin Leary? And I was like, who's Devin Leary? Cool. And he's like a 25, almost 26 year old <laughs> quarterback for Kentucky. I think he's been a six year player in in college football. Yeah. And well, he, he was like, he was he was really poor at NC State. And uh, you know, was somebody who people were talking about could be like a mid round pick uh, a few years ago. And then he it, it never really happened for him at NC State. He went to Kentucky, and it didn't really happen for him there last year. Uh, for me, I, I wouldn't I would not draft Devin Leary. And Spencer Rattler, whether he becomes a starting NFL quarterback or not, the talent is there. Like, it would not be a big surprise if, like, look, uh, Jalen Hurts was a second-round pick and has taken a team to the Super Bowl. Like, it's not. it would not be a huge surprise if Spencer Rattler was taken between 50 and 65 and similarly on a good roster was able to take a team to the Super Bowl so or, or to have a run. So I, I think that that's a no-brainer for me that it's Rattler. All right, so Ryan Watts, is that your pick here? Final answer? Uh, yeah, why not? Okay, so we've got Ryan Watts. We've got the first of the drafts where, where Rob gets to pick in the second round a couple of times, but not in the first. How do you feel coming out of this? Chop Robinson, Edron Cooper, Christian Haynes, Spencer Rattler, Malik Mustafa, Jaheim Bell, James Williams, and Ryan Watts. Well, I think, you know, at the top, you've got a potential impact pass rusher. You've got a, a linebacker who, you know, you can ease in, but can can easily be a starting will for the long term. You've got a guard in Christian Haynes, who I would imagine would win the job over Lake and Tomlinson or Anthony Bradford, if you want to keep it on the right side. Spent the rat as a quarterback who could legitimately down the line compete to start. You know, he'd be sort of the number three quarterback this year uh, if you take him in round four. But you know, there's there's some upside potential there. Why not? It's a shot to nothing in round four. Malik Mustafa could start this year. Um, I think Watts provides some depth at defensive back. I, I think it's a draft that's got it's a mix of upside uh, and intrigue with impact, and uh, I think it would be a. I, I'd be really content with that class personally. Jeff, how about you? I think Haynes at 81 would be like a <laughs> that's a draft changing pick potentially. He's a really I think he might be a top 45 player. The thing I just I come down to with all these things is I talked about that rant about getting more physical and bigger and stronger. I like every pick Rob made, but again, I think that trade out of 16 is what makes it so challenging for me because I know we, we forced this on Rob and this was the theme of the mock draft, so I can't really knock the drafter here, but would you rather have verse or Byron Murphy or chop and or and Cooper? And that's the part of it. I, I struggle with because I, I run into that rant about getting bigger and more physical. I like every player on the list. You got a lot faster. If Rattler hits, this is a home run draft. I, I love Mustafa. Mustafa is one of my favorite players in this class. He's like that. My guy, Rob's actually the one who got me on him in the first place. So I really like every pick that was made. It's just, it's, you got a lot faster. You definitely got, I'm a little concerned about the offensive line still. And if you got bigger and stronger enough, so I can't really, I don't, that's where I struggle with this whole trade thing, because I don't know who you could have picked him that would have switched that. And here's the other thing, Jeff, what if Jerome Baker plays really well this year? Have you just wasted the pick on Edwin Cooper? You've acquired the extra pick and spent it on a backup. If Jerome Baker and Dodson play lights out this year, you're going to want to resign them. You're not going to want to yeah. move them on and play Edron Cooper 
So does that end up being a bit of a waste to pick anyway? If he's if he's a backup. Yeah, the thing for me in this scenario is I don't think it makes sense to stick and pick at 36 and 40. I think you'd really want to parlay one of those down into I think if you get into the 50s, then for me, that is a logical place to take either your favorite interior offensive lineman on the board or your favorite left interior defensive lineman. So that could be a place that Michael Hall makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you've got two third round picks as well. And then you've got the first pick of the, the second pick of the fourth round. So I think for me, I, I could get interested in this kind of scenario. I would even be okay with a linebacker as the second pick, but I think I'd want that to be later. And I think, you know, I'd, I'd hope it would be for me, I'd hope it'd be junior Colson, but, but uh, you know, could get behind Edger and Cooper for sure. And I think the other challenge is if, if your picks in the second round are either on the edge or smaller players, like you're, you're talking about Jeff, I think you're going to have a hard time really establishing the physical tough stuff that you want to do, because I do think the defensive tackle position falls off pretty fast after the second round, unless you can get sweat in the fourth. Like um, if you can get sweat in the fourth, I think the whole draft changes <laughs> for me. Like, I think that's a, that's a big fulcrum and i just don't know like that's one player he's the only player that is like him and so you can't build your whole draft board around that um did you guys want to do one more or should we wrap there i don't mind i could do one more all right let's do one more let's do let's do the uh other drafts sam we're gonna do seven rounds we're gonna do super fast and we will decide together what we want to do here um so jared verse is there fautanu's there byron murphy's there barton graham barton's there what do you guys want to do i would be willing to trade only to 20 Trade to 20 with the Steelers. Yeah. What about you? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, I have, I mean, I would take for Tano, but I understand why, where Jeff's coming from, because I can see four players. I'd be very happy to take. So if you trade to 20, you will definitely get one of those. All right. So the Steelers, we would pick we, the trade that we would offer them is just to keep it realistic. We would give them 16 and we would receive 20 and 98. Yeah, I would probably do that. That's that's the realistic trade offer here. Well, <laughs> how can I force it? Oh, I know how I can force it, right? Just offer um, a future or something. I'll offer them something crazy. Um, Pittsburgh, continue. So we'll give them 16 and the first next year. <laughs> And we get 20 and 98. All right. So that's a realistic move down. Who went? Fautanu, Mims, Verse, gone. So now are we aligned on Byron Murphy here? Or is it Graham Barton? I think Murphy's the higher rated player. Yeah, I would want Murphy. Done. Byron Murphy. I haven't done this scenario yet. I'm kind of curious to see how this plays out. With an extra third, you could conceivably trade back into the second, but let's just see how this goes straight. Um, interesting. So, so Nealon's there at eighty-one. I don't. Nealon's that. there. That seems like a pretty interesting, but sweat. Sweat's there. <laughs> Pooney's there. Sane Restrell's there. I can't imagine them picking a, a nickel, but that would be great. Rattler's there. Jaden Hicks is there. A lot of these guys are still there. Um, what do you guys think? Where would be your first instinct? Just took a defensive tackle, three tech. So I don't think Rook makes sense. Or uh, my my instinct would probably be to, I mean, look, if it depends what you want to do. If you're going to go for the best player available, it it it'd probably be Fisk, Neeland, um, you know, those kind of players. 
But if you wanted to go for, okay, we've, we have a clear offensive need, then Pooney. And if you wanted to, if you believed that Spencer Rattler had the chance to be, a, a, you know, an NFL starter, I think he would have to be in the conversation as well. But it really depends what you want to do. Like if you want to do best player, we do kind of best player available for Byron Murphy. If that was the approach, then um, it, it's probably uh, one of the, the players near the top of this board. Uh, fiscal Neyland, I would suggest. How do you feel about Trevin Wallace? I talked to Chad Ryder this week who had Trevin Wallace going to the Seahawks in the second round. Um, Flies around and, yeah. uh, you know, he's, he's he's sparky and he's quick. The He's not the biggest guy and he does get washed out sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, the it's, it's hard to sort of it, – it's kind of the taste that you want. Like, it's very easy to imagine him being a good – NFL player, but I, I quite like, I don't know I, whether the physicality would catch up with him a little bit. You know, I want, I want a linebackers who, who are quick, fast, and just fly around and hit people. And he does a bit of that, but he is, um, there are some times when he gets washed out, but he will go in the, in the top 75. Okay. Um, all right. So Brian, you, Brian, why don't you make the pick? I mean, honestly, here? I wouldn't. I would. I. I. I think that the magic zone for offense for interior offensive line after the first round is actually the fourth mm -hmm. round. So I would yeah. wait at least till pick ninety eight, where we're going to get four picks. You know, we're going to get ninety eight and one hundred two. Oh yeah, we got three picks coming up here. Right. So I. I mean, honestly, it's very hard for me not to pick Sweat here. I think he's that important, but. Um, I think I'd probably go linebacker because it empties out so much after this. But Marshawn Nealand is staring at me. It's hard for me like, to get my finger off that. <laughs> it's hard to see it. him being at 81. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go Nealand. I'm going to go Nealand. We haven't drafted him yet. We're going to get a hey, talk about well, talk. There goes Sweat get... and Pooney. <laughs> Might. There goes. Oh, Sweat go. Yeah. See, that's to the Baltimore. thing. Baltimore. Oh. That's the thing is is like you 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 fall for this that he's going to be there in the fourth round and then he's gone. There's nobody else. You just lost him. So that that's the hard part. Um. So now, like I know Rattler staring at us. Let's do something different. Um. Interesting that Booker's here. Like I would probably would have been just as happy with Booker as I would have been with with Neiland. Um. Booker yeah, might even have more upside. Sweat Booker. Sanders still, he's no way he's going to be here this late. I don't believe that. Um, I think Jaden Hicks is an interesting pick here. Uh, if you don't have Mason McCormick is an interesting pick here. So let's just look at, let's look at the guards. Yeah. He jumps off the page to me. Zinter. He's a good player. Yeah, which of these guys would you go for? Because we're going to get to pick again in a few picks. Well, the the word, the increasing buzz seems to be that Zint is going to last into day three. Mm. Uh, so I think that and McCormick is just an exceptional athlete. Yeah, so yeah McCormick pride. jumps off the page to me. Let's do it. So we got we got McCormick, and now we're up again. So now we're into the fourth round. I mean, now it's kind of like. I mean, Rattler Jaden Hicks here. jumps off the board. Trevin Wallace becomes an interesting name. You haven't drafted a linebacker yet. Booker's still there. Taylor Demerson's there. I think there's going to be a safety at one. Mustafa's there. Yeah. Bordellini is a guy that a lot of folks are kind of interested. I haven't looked as closely at him. He's a real athlete. Yeah. I love Malik Washington. I mean, I think he'd be a really interesting ad. Jalen Ford, Theo Johnson. Yeah, that'd be pretty tempting. What do you think, uh, Rob? What, what's what's uh, other yeah, than Spencer Rattler? What would you do here? I mean, I think Theo Johnson's very. Uh, I think if he was, I think he could well be a, a big target for them. I don't think he'll last around four, but uh, I can well imagine them liking Theo Johnson. Ticks a lot of boxes for what they've looked for in the past, so. Uh, he is on my board, fringe two, three. So getting him in round four would be pretty special. But then uh, Taylor Demerson's, 
I've got him as a legit round two. So they're the and about have Mustafa as well. So uh, it's whether or not you want to mix things up a little bit. Yeah, maybe we'll mix things up. Jeff, anyone else that jumps out to you? Well, Sanderstrill, but yeah, I would take him yeah. here. He ain't gonna be though, is he? He ain't gonna. He's be not, there. I just can't do it because there's no. just no way. It's not. I mean, it's not. It would be fun though. Uh, we haven't done Taylor Demerson yet, have we? No, I don't think let's, so. More Trevor. Let's Walls. do him. Yeah. Let's do him. And I, I wouldn't. Who knows? Maybe Theo will last all the way till here. He does. So he's still available. You've got a safety. You still have knock on linebacker. Uh, Malik Washington's still there. And this is your last pick until 179. So whoever we pick here, like, do you want to do Theo Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Let's do Theo because he's definitely not going to be around. This is going to mean that we're going to have to hope that a guy like Michael Barrett's there later. Um, so if we didn't take center. We could have doubled up. Could have doubled up. Gabe Hall. Yep. He's a big boy. Oh, Marist. Marist, Marist isn't a guy I would draft this late. What are your thoughts on Marist, uh, Rob? Any thoughts there? Yeah, solid. Uh, what, is, what is he on my board? Oh, Brandon Jackson. I don't think we have an edge yet. Oh, no, we took Neyland. We took Neyland, yeah. Dylan McMahon. Yeah. I had, uh, yeah, I had, uh, Lou Fowers, uh, sort of fifth, sixth fringe. Mm, okay. So, yeah. So we're right, right, right 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 yeah. Um, Jeff, you make this pick. Uh, we haven't taken a linebacker yet. I'm going to take the Notre Dame kid. All right. Done. Got our next second round pick. This is your pick, Rob. Uh, ooh. Well, what have we taken again? Just uh, let's have a look and yeah, see. Yeah, we have on. taken Byron Murphy, Marshawn Neeland, Mason McCormick, Taylor Demerson, Theo Johnson, Maris Lufau. And this is late round six, isn't it? Let's go. Yeah, this offense. is late round six, and then we've got the seventh pick, seventh round pick after this. Offense. Uh, oh, there we go. Ryan Florney. Ryan Florney? Yeah. All right. Done. Tell us about Ryan. What do you like about Ryan Florney? Excellent senior bowl. Uh, very, very athletic. Uh, separates very easily. He's got huge hands. He's got like 10 and a half inch hands, even though he's 6'1 and 200 pounds. Uh, extreme high character guy. Just somebody who I, I don't think he's going to be available in round six. I think he's going to go a lot earlier than people think uh, and has got a chance to, to make it in the NFL. Really good player. Love it. All right. Um, I, with this last pick, I'm going to take Anthony Gold out of Oregon State. Double Seventh round flyer on a on a slot receiver. And what do we? How do we feel about this? I mean, look, you've got you've got uh, you know two defensive linemen who are very talented players. Uh, obviously, Nealon would almost certainly not be there at 81, but. You know, it, it, the two really good players, uh, you know, McCormick would t challenge immediately for start time at guard. I think Taylor Demerson would start immediately. Theo Johnson would be probably a tight end three, but could develop to tight end two by the end of the season. So, you know, you've, you're have you looking at one legit starter, possibly two, uh, possibly three, actually, with Taylor Demerson, and then Neyland, who's a, a very useful rotational guy. So I think it would be an impactful draft. Yeah, Jeff, I, I don't know where you are. This this like, this like is like a solid B to B plus for me. I, I I like the way this falls a little bit in that, I mean, any draft that comes out with Byron Murphy, I'm going to feel at least okay that at the top of the draft we've used resources appropriately. Marshawn Neeland, I don't think it's crazy that he slides this long. I mean, I think he's more likely to be a first rounder than a third rounder, but yeah, um, I don't think it's like out of the realm of possibility that he would be available here, depending on how things fell. Mason McCormick, this is kind of my thought is if you don't get your first round interior offensive lineman, I think what you're doing is picking a developmental guy. It could be McCormick, it could be Zinter coming off injury, it could be a number of these players, you know, Layden Robinson, um, We'll see where Christian Mahogany goes, whoever it is. 
And now if they start, great. If not, they, you can basically have a developmental guard prospect that's available for next year. McCormick perfectly fits that kind of scenario. And then, you know, you've got some guys along the way there. I happen to think Gold would be a, a, a good seventh round pick. I'd be happy to get him. He's up. He could be a good UDFA too. But um, I think after Murphy, a lot of these are developmental guys. Even Theo Johnson, as much as we all like him, it's a lot on his physical talents as, and a little bit less on what he's proven as a receiver so far. So, um, you know, all these are pretty much projection kind of guys after Murphy. What are your thoughts, Jeff? Yeah, that's exactly my thought. I think if we take McCormick in 98, I would love to double down at guard. I think like getting Zinter and McCormick would be a really – like if you flipped one of Demerson and Johnson for Zinter there, I think that would really excite me. A, you might have two starters there, and one you're just hedging on the other one. You're just balancing the risk and reward. So it puts a lot of on McCormick to hit. McCormick hitting really dictates a lot of that draft. But the trade down, ultimately, we gave up probably Fautanu for Murphy and McCormick. I think I think we'd all take that trade, right? Yes. I Rob, oh sorry, I would. I don't know. Rob, you go ahead. I mean, I love Fatonu, so I would I would take him. Uh, do you know what I was going to ask you, though? How would you feel about you know, if you're going to double down on guards, if you could get Zinter in round four, which is the same range they got Anthony Bradford? Yeah. Uh, and then Trevor Keegan in round five, which was where they got Olu Olawatimi last year. You could realistically have Michigan's starting interior O-line from <laughs> 2022, which would be interesting given that Scott Huff would be the one uh, coaching up <laughs> Michigan Oh, like, but look, they they won the Outland Trophy in back to back years. So it, it, I can think of, and they played like an NFL O line for two years. And you just wonder whether or not it's not the Outland Trophy. So that's for the one guy. It's, it, I'm forgetting. Remington, what maybe? Called. I can't remember what it's called. It's like the Joe Moore Award or something like that for the best oh, O line. Yeah. And, uh, and Washington, Denver, Washington yeah. won it last year. Uh, the Outland ones, I think, is for the, for the best defensive lineman, isn't it? Which is what all the team he won. But um, I think you could do a lot worse if you if you said, right, we're just going to try and copy Michigan's O-line. And they, they didn't have great tackles, but they had very productive interior offensive linemen. I, I think you could do a lot worse than that, especially in round four and five. Yeah, the, this draft will will feel very different if they pick a quarterback in the top four rounds, top three rounds especially. Everything else starts to to shift around that, and you don't know what you're getting out of that pick this year. You probably are not getting much necessarily. So that'll be a key thing. And if if Rob, you're right, which you predicted, the Seahawks will pick a guy like Rattler in the third round or second, uh, then all bets are off in terms of safety, linebacker, even interior offensive line, depending how that plays out. It's going to be interesting. It's it's going to be... I think we're going to learn a lot about the direction of this team in uh, in a few days' time, this time next week. The And I do think they will they will take a quarterback. And I don't think it will be a throwaway. What I... I, I and not just Rattler. I think Pratt is, is is probably, you know, the next one. And the one before both of them is Penix. And I, until I see Michael Penix holding up... Well, he won't be holding up a jersey. He's not going to Detroit, is he? holding up a draft cap wherever he is, Florida, wherever his family is based, with a different logo on it. I'm going to think there's uh, half a chance that he will end up in uh, Seattle. Like this, how often does a, an NFL team go and appoint an offensive coordinator from a college football team? Doesn't and happen that, very often. And, and that, no, we, and we did coach, a study. <laughs> and that coach is, has had unbelievable success in Michael Penix. I mean, he is – Penix, you can you – can, as we, we spoke about this a bit earlier – you can imagine Penix, some of the issues with Penix creating him sufficient problems that restrict his ability to be the player that he he has the potential to be because of his arm. But you also have the potential to see him throw 40 touchdowns and four and a half to 5,000 yards because he can launch the ball downfield. And the, the one thing I've just kept thinking, I can't get it out of my head, that Hugh Millen has taken every opportunity on KJR to say, Nudge wink, nudge wink. They want to make DK Metcalf the one of the best receivers in the league. And I think that they have decided that they haven't forced the ball to DK Metcalf enough. 1v1. What is my Michael Penix's calling card? I can see Roma Dunze 1v1. The ball's going there. No hesitation. It's going to him. And Odunze made those plays. 
Can DK Metcalf be as consistent as a Dunze? Probably not, because his hands are not as good. But if they want someone who is going to get under centre and go, I am going to isolate that guy and we are going to throw it to him 1v1, then Penix is perfect for that. And he would be perfect for throwing the ball downfield to Jackson Smith in Jigba because his touch throws on that sort of, you know, you can just, can't you just imagine Smith and Jigba lining up in slot, running to the outside 30, 40 yards downfield? And how do you defend that with Penix's arm? Like it could virtually be unstoppable at times. So I don't know, man. Like it's an, I know people are not, you, you're either sort of all in on Penix or the opposite. I'm not a Husky fan. But I've yeah. seen all of the games he's played, and there is something there. There is something there. And if he is in range and you love him, it will be unforgivable, especially if what happens in my mock today, which is the Rams go and uh, trade up and get him to be uh, the Matt Stafford replacement. Mm. Uh, Rob, tell us what you got coming up this week. When are you going to do your final mock? Final mock will be on Wednesday. Um, and it's... I. Uh, I actually don't know what I'm going to do for the next couple of days. There's a chance of a couple of uh, interviews. There is a chance uh, that I'm just going to end up writing some ridiculous article that takes up all night. Uh, uh, and there's also a chance that I might just sleep for the next 24 days because I've had the worst bout of man flu today. Oh, uh, man. That I need to go and sleep. So I don't know. But I'm uh, the definite mock draft. The final mock is... Uh, it's going to be Wednesday. So that'll be the one that everybody gets to tell me how wrong I am afterwards. <laughs> well, uh, Jeff, you have participating in the, uh, the prediction game that we're doing for YouTube members and Patreon members. And we've got your mock draft in there. I personally have mine in there. I'm going to have to go back. I'll probably retouch mine up on Wednesday right now. I think I have the Seahawks getting Byron Murphy and, I, that's not going to be my final selection because I just, I'm confident, I'm convinced, I guess I should say, that Byron Murphy's going to go before the Seahawks have a chance to pick him. So we'll see what happens there. I will update that. Um, Jeff's got his in there as well. And then, folks, uh, if you haven't already, please join up on YouTube. Uh, the link is in the chats and it's in the description of the video. Join at patreon.com slash hawkblogger. You can join, get access to the audio versions of all these podcasts, as well as to the, the Slack channel, all sorts of great stuff. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger. Rob, thank you so much for joining us again. We will have to do a post-draft debrief. Um, we'll figure out when we'll do that. But looking forward to, to going through this with you this week. And we will talk, my friend, as this all uh, uh, unfolds. So thanks again for coming on. No, thank you for the invite. It's been, uh, I can't believe the, 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 we've done three of these, haven't we? And the, the, that time has just flown by. Yes. And here we are. And I really appreciate I think it's been every single show. And when Griffin's been with us as well, it's been a fantastic conversation to be part of. So uh, I really appreciate the invite. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the time that we've had doing this. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. That is Rob Staten. You can find him at CX Draft Blog and find him at PuckSports.com every Thursday. You can find them everywhere. That's Rob Staten, the man, Seahawks Draft Blog. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This has been another episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. Have a great rest of your day.